Angry waters off the Sunshine State give a not so warm welcome to a rescue swimmer transferring from Alaska. A boat floating in the water is pretty easy to spot on a clear day like today. We didn't see anything. In Miami, the team struggles to save a boat just seconds from going under. Yeah, that boat's almost under. Go down back. And in Clearwater, a captain refuses to leave his sinking ship. Our options are starting to dwindle down. Unless he can bail it fast enough with a the bucket, then he's going to be. Uh, yeah, he's going to be swimming. The Florida Peninsula, a hotbed for Mother Nature's fury. Here, every day, the brave men and women of the Coast Guard's busiest boat and air stations vigilantly patrol nearly two million square miles of turbulent waters, protecting the public from the dangerous elements and preventing foreign threats and illegal drugs from reaching our shores. America's southern waters are protected by Coast Guard Florida. Pond, 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 all stations, all stations. Coast Guard received a report of a 36-foot vessel sinking in the city of Gubernica. All vessels are requested to keep a sharp lookout and report all sightings to the Coast Guard. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, let's go. My uh, name's Jeremy Nees, fireman. We got a call about a uh, boat hitting a submerged object in government cut. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We are sinking, guys. We are going down now. There's that white light there to my zero one zero. P6 ready? Go, P6 is ready. If the boat goes down in uh, government cut, that's a big issue because cruise ships go out of there, freighters come in. Yeah, that boat's almost on there. And it's going down back, bro. Can you know yeah, 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 yeah. My name is Petty Officer Victor Ramirez. When we got on scene, it was just a matter of minutes, maybe even seconds, before that whole boat was under. The owner of the vessel was screaming, save my boat, save my boat. Is there a way we can open the front of the boat? Do you have a hatch? There was one commercial salvage on scene where he had the pump was towards the stern. All the water was up in the bow. Hey, watch oh, it goes down, you better come get it. Hey, if anything happens, jump on those boats. We went towards the bow of the boat and uh, jammed the hose to the P6 down inside of there. P6 pump we use, it approximately pumps out 250 gallons a minute. Commercial salvage does not really have pumps that are capable of like pumping out that much water. Follow them and say we need the other pump here. Call, call station, say we need the point, get the 25 to bring us the pump. By that time, the freeboard was about three to four inches from going under the water. If the vessel sinks, we're gonna have fuel, we're gonna have debris in the water, and it's an environmental issue. Right there, the north side of government cut the jetties. We have a lot of movement, tankers, cruise ships. Uh, I'm here in the middle of government cut with uh, this vessel taking on water, and I see a tanker coming out. We had a tanker coming out of the jetties at the same time, and it was pitch black. You can't see them. If you were to hit that boat, it would create damage to, to another vessel, and it'd be just a domino effect. Vessel Seaboard, Florida. This is Coast Guard Sector, Miami. Uh, yes, we understand. We're outbound there, and we will go by on the north side of them there. Roger, Captain. Appreciate it. Just request you maintain minimum wake. I think it's coming in as fast as we're pumping it out. We weren't getting anywhere. We called in another vessel to come out and bring another P6 pump. Hey, let me come to you, Victor. All right. Let me come to you. Going over, stay there. When we arrived on scene with the second boat, the boat was still halfway full. The amount of water that was in there was pretty obvious that they had a big gash in the bottom of the hole. We had four P6 pumps going, which was a pretty neat scene to see, four P6 pumps going and just seeing at all corners of the boat water coming out of it. If we can find where it's coming in, we can get the DC kit out and stuff the hole. Hey, got it in the water. Chuck from Commercial Salvage actually jumped in the water and tried to patch the hole while we were taking the water out. We ended up grabbing pillows, blankets, Nerf footballs, anything we could find and 
have him stuffing in the hole just to keep the water from coming in. All right, we got to slow down. Hey, we're, we're keeping up with it right now, so. You can see the water level going down and the boat's starting to rise. Call section, let them know that you are uh, going to uh, less than taking on water. I'm trying to get permission to get into the travel lift so we can patch it and at least they can make forward progress because like this, they're not going anywhere. We were very close to the station and we were actually able to bring it here to get it out of the water versus potentially having it sink in a channel. Grab that line. Grab this line. We're just going to pull it. All right, that's good. I just went up so we can see the hall, see how much damage there is. One of the biggest dangers about boating at night is submerged objects. Due to the fact that you cannot see them, they're very difficult to avoid. The owner had over 30 years in boating experience. First thing he did was hail for Mayday over Channel 16, and that's why we were able to respond so quickly. That's why whenever we went forward, it was making it sink more, you know? It was a joint effort between us, CETO, Fast Response, and everybody involved. Everybody came together real quick, and we all worked together and got the job done safely and efficiently. I mean, I called. When I called on 16, yeah. you guys were there in three minutes. Yeah. Yeah, here in Miami Beach, you, you got to be ready for anything. No case is ever the same. Uh, you could be fighting fires one day, fighting fl floods the next day, smugglers the next, boat crashes, and, and we got to be ready and, and trained for just about anything. The last thing that I wanted, like I said, was your boat to stand. No, you guys did a fantastic job. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not sticking my hand down there. Are we ready? Oh, you guys want action, you're gonna get it now. I'm Petty Officer Victor Ramirez. I'm stationed in Miami Beach. We came out here to have a morale day, uh, took out the crew out to the Everglades for an airboat ride, just uh, to get away from work for a little bit. Hey, everybody, welcome aboard. My name is George. Everybody ready? Yeah! I worked here after high school for five years. They've heard stories but never knew what I did. So this was a uh, first hand. They got to see exactly what I've done basically my whole life. Luckily, having Petty Officer Ramirez from here, we are getting really up close and personal with some of the, uh, the wildlife uh, in this area. Hey, Josh, look at him. <laughs> He's gonna go in the water? Are you really going in the water? I can't watch this. Vic, what are you doing? A lot of things started catching us by surprise. I didn't know that Victor was gonna try to catch an alligator. He can't get in the water, is he? Yeah. He's getting in the water? Are you freaking... Whoa, look at him. Vic, what are you doing? Where did he go? You can't see him. Are you kidding me? Dude, are you kidding? Get out of the water. It runs in the family. I love animals. I love adrenaline, basically. I should have gone to him so fast. Yeah, he's like, that's now, a... now he's all sketched out. It was pretty funny, because who would have thought an alligator would be scared of him? That's a gator then. Having a crew member like Victor, you know, it's it's amazing. Now you know I can trust him to do anything on the boat. You know, he's not scared to do anything. Oh my God, he is not getting in there with that thing. I mean, I never thought this guy that works with me, you know, he's over here jumping on alligators like there's no tomorrow. I got the tail. We had to move some alligators from one pen to another because they outgrew it. Those are the most dangerous ones. All right, let's move this guy now over to the lake. So the bigger one is still loose. This is as close as I'm comfortable with. <laughs> it's just been great. Now, I couldn't have asked for a, a really more interesting day since I've been here at uh, Station Miami Beach. All in all, a good day like this, we needed a break from work, you know. Just to know that he does this is pretty cool. Walking the dog. It was awesome to have everybody over here. When I was jumping on top of an alligator, everybody's eyes were the size of saucers. It was, it was, I like that. You all right, Vic? Need a drink? Yeah. <laughs> Starboard side. Coming up, guys. We're all thinking the same thing. Is he drunk or is he just, you know, going for a swim? I got it. I got it. I got it.
Yeah, I got it, TJ. I got, I got a look. Right. Good. Go. Liam one Justin Bowes received a report of a man swimming across the harbor to Sunset Key. Safety West, South Point 3, underway. You guys good to go? Very good. We were told that he appeared to be intoxicated. He was supposed to swim in the harbor, so we launched a boat and a boat crew. You guys all know what's going on. Drunk swimmer in the water. We're going to get him out of the water. My concern is I don't want him to drown. He's putting himself in danger. There's a lot of jet ski traffic, so it's a hazard to navigation. And you know, ultimately, he's putting the public in danger in himself. There he's right there, right there, right there. Yep, got him. Got him. Starboard uh, side. Coming up, guys. Stop. Stop swimming. You're getting out of the water. Stop. Stop. Ready when you are. I'm BM2 Stratton Leo. We're all thinking the same thing. Is he drunk or is he just, you know, going for a swim? If he is intoxicated, we don't know what they're going to do. So we have to be ready for if he's going to start swinging or if he's just going to be happy to see us. You never really know. You been drinking today? Negative, sir. Not at all? No, sir. Why are you swimming across the harbor? I was trying to get with scary out. Do you understand the safety hazard that you're creating out here? All these jet skis, all these jet skis coming through? There's about 20 jet skis coming between the islands, OK? okay. That's the hazard that I'll you're creating. I'll take your word for it. We can't really arrest for swimming in the harbor. It's just not safe. I was aiming for Sunset Key. So why were you trying to go to Sunset Key? I understand for my passport. It's a public. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> this guy's probably drunk. The conversations we were having were running in circles, and we weren't getting any straight answers out of him. I'm going to Europe on a catamaran. I want a beacon from you. Looking for like an E-perp kind of thing? I have an E-perp, dumbass. I got the West Marine. Why, why are you starting to get loud here? I'm not. I, I'm deaf in one ear. I can't hear you. Okay. I mean, obviously, we don't want to have any issues. We don't want to have to put people in handcuffs. We don't want to have to go hands-on with anybody. So we do try to, you know, work with people a little bit and just neutralize situations. So what are you doing down here? Are you just on vacation? Uh, I'm retired. I don't have nothing else better to do to play with you guys. Yeah? Yeah, we can play this all the time if you want. Where'd you retire from? I'm Pet Officer Sice. When we ran Whiskey Whiskey on the gentleman in the water, that, that's wants and warrants. Uh, he didn't come back with any warrants. However, when we looked into his history, three months ago, he had an assault charge. And then two weeks ago, he had a felony assault charge right here in Key West. Yeah. Hey, I ain't going in that car. Let's to see what the officer wants to do. And I don't know if it's a weekend charge in What are you going to do, a DUI? No, exactly. I wasn't doing anything wrong. It's going to be up to the uh, boarding officer and then the uh, QSPD here. So QSPD. Luckily for the individual that was in the water, we couldn't really charge him with anything. I'll get that stamp from Sons like he yet. I'm not going to tell you when. Try to catch me uh, again. Next time I'll have my boat Hopefully here. you're in a boat next time when you do it. Key West Police Department will give him a ride somewhere. But I, I would guess that if he goes to the same place he was and he starts drinking and doing his thing again, he'll be in the water again. Takes all kinds, takes all kinds. Sir. <laughs> same thing, different guy. The uh, OD got the call that there was somebody else in the harbor swimming around again. Same guy? Definitely a different guy. Maybe that guy dared this guy. I'd rather you not swim through the harbor. It was somebody else, just another drunk down on Duval Street. Did you dare someone earlier to swim across the harbor? No, I just said it because I thought I could. I didn't realize it was somebody before. Oh, yeah. Oh, is he in jail now? No. He was uh, clearly intoxicated, like, from our standards, visually intoxicated. I, 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 I'm so not drunk. I am drinking, but I'm not drunk. Can, can I just, like, go ahead and go now? Nah, just do me a favor and uh, just sit there, OK? He was saying he wasn't, so we just needed some kind of proof that he was or not. OK, so we're going to run FSTs on him okay. just because I'm tired of people jumping in the harbor and then getting a ride to the, to the dock and walking out of the back gate. OK, here's what we're going to do. Your finger to nose. I didn't tell you to start yet. I didn't tell you to start yet. It's kind of hard not to keep a straight face sometimes. 
Next is gonna be the finger count. One, two, three, four. Now, come on, that's really hard. I could not even do that so. I mean, if you looked around at the other guys sitting around, everybody kind of had a smirk on their face because we all knew he was just drunk. And I want you to look at just the silver tip of the pen right there. You right. can tell yeah. something's not right there. Right. That's the best policeman right there, that guy. <laughs> you guys friends? Because <laughs> history? The dinner together? Yeah. yeah. No, there's one. Yeah. How did I fail everyone? I... I don't know. It's nice to have the good guys just to be like, hey, I'm sorry. You know, 90% of them are apologetic and they're just drunk. He's a nice person. This dude is cool. We, we can off his pool right now and have a guess when we'll see him again. I will see, we'll bet we see him for tomorrow. Put him in handcuffs. <laughs> cool. All right. Just another crazy afternoon on the water, typical Key West style. This dude is cool. Yeah, that's serious. You have a vessel that's disabled to start taking on water. Coast Guard, need a cover. Come out here and get me. I have no power. I'm dead in the water. So we can wait into the helicopter or uh, send me a vessel and call me home. That's my livelihood. He's adamant that he's not coming off the vessel no matter what. AST-1 Scott Gordon, and I'm a rescue swimmer here at Air Station Clearwater. I came here from Kodiak, Alaska, and I transferred down to Clearwater, Florida this summer. First thing I noticed is uh, this place is hot. <laughs> the day I left Kodiak, it was in the middle of June, and it was about 40 degrees, it was raining, and then I got down here and it was 92 degrees plus high humidity. I'm getting, getting kind of used to it now, but uh, it was definitely a very big difference. Hey, hey. Hey. Scott Gordon, how you doing, man? Good. Welcome to Clearwater. Thanks, guys. It's been a while. I know it. Welcome, man. Uh, how's everything going? Uh, doing good, yeah. I'm checking in. Cool. Well, the uh, chief and them in the back of the shop. We'll go in there and say hello. All right. When you get to a new place, it's just like being the new kid in a new high school, you know? I mean, yeah, you're going to do the same kind of classes, you know, the same kind of job, and uh, but you have all new people you're going to meet. New guy. Scott, how you doing? Hey, Chief, good. Hey, good, good to see you. Nice seeing you. Yeah, travels go good? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Good deal. Great, glad to have you here. here. Uh, it's going, right? It's going. I've seen you forever. I know. The research. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, what's going on, man? Good, man? good to see you, dude. Wow, it's been a while. It's been a long time. It was a good welcome, you know. Also, some of the guys already knew him, you know, beforehand. I've been stationed with some before. Some of them I didn't know. One of the guys here was our airman up in, in Kodiak, so that was kind of nice. How long did you up in Kodiak now? Five years. Five? Yeah. Just, were you looking to stay in here for, I mean, I mean, more than four, or are you going to stay here after? Yeah, yeah I don't know yet. Yeah. We'll see. I'll see what... Good. We need you to stay on duty tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you got ready, crew. Uh, you got an oncoming tomorrow. You're staying in duty tomorrow. You got the backup tonight. <laughs> that's just uh, that's kind of how it was when I left Kodiak. The deployments down here are going to be, I think, interesting. You know, up in Kodiak, we went to some crazy far-off islands out in the Bering Sea. But down here, we get to deploy to the Bahamas. I'm looking forward to going to those places. This should be a lot of fun. I'm Captain John Turner. Just got a call in about a uh, emergency position indicating radio beacon, which is an EPIRB, that has been going off for about the last 30 minutes, coming from the fishing vessel SCOBY 2. Rescue 6023, be advised for airborne at this time. Uh, weather is clear, the visibility is uh, 10, 20 miles, uh, sea is 1 to 2 feet, and uh, we're headed 90 miles northwest of Clearwater. Look how calm the water is out here. Yeah, it's laid down quite a bit. 
fishing vessel Scoby 2, Scoby 2, Coast Guard copter on channel 16. Uh, yep, over. Okay, nothing heard. We'll proceed on to see about 11 miles out. Roger. I don't see anything on radar out there. One little boat breaks the wake out there. There's actually another vessel out here, too. I see a boat out at the 1 o'clock. No, yeah. that's not him. Okay. Anytime we get an EPIRB case, think about the worst case scenario, which is, you know, a vessel has sunk. And then another scenario that typically happens with an EPIRB is that you actually have a vessel that's disabled, it's started taking on water, its engine room's flooded, so they lose their ability to communicate on the radio. Fishing vessel Scoby 2, Coast Guard copter on channel 16. Uh, yep, over. Fishing vessel Scoby 2, Scoby 2, Coast Guard copter on channel 16. Uh, yep, over. Got a call in about an emergency position indicating radio beacon, which is an EPIRB that has been going off for about the last 30 minutes, coming from the fishing vessel SCOBY-2. Yeah, we got one around at 3 o'clock right now. Okay, let's take a look at this guy. That could be him. That's the SCOBY-2. It's definitely the SCOBY-2. Yeah. It's got it written on We see the SCOBY-2, and there's what looks like a good SAM alongside. Yeah, call us Coast Guard helicopter. Fishing vessel speculator. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, I think we got you inside. You guys are alongside each other? Roger, roger. I'm tied up to him here right now. The SCOBY-2 is pretty much dead in the water, and the good Sam was helping them out. They were using their battery to help pump some of the water off. They were taking on water. I don't know what to do with him. I can't sit here and babysit him. I, I need to work. Yeah, Roger, good copy. Yeah, this guy's not going to stay with them forever, so uh, he may need somebody to come get him. Took us about 40 minutes to get out of here. Probably burned about 1,000 pounds. So yeah, we're only going to be able to stay on scene for another hour if we need to. What I might do is offer up the radio and a pump, and we'll have the good sand break away. We can drop it to him, and he can go back over and get to him. Roger. What we decided to do was uh, hoist to the good sand, the pump, and then a radio as well, so we could have comms with the SCOBY-2. Speculator, are you ready for the hoist, sir? Sir, my man's on the front of the boat, ready. Got your target in sight. All right, pick in the hoist. Challenge going on the cabin door, going down. And connecting challenge to the hook. Pump's going out the cabin door. Roger. And pump's going down. Hold forward, right side. Go right and hold. Pump is on deck. Now after we deliver the pump to the speculator, we go into an orbit while we wait. And we wait for quite a while, probably uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Oh, where's a good Sam went? He's already, he's already gone. Hey, he's gone. Coast Guard, helicopter. Scoby 2, you right? Scoby 2 from the Coast Guard Hilo on uh, 16. Yeah, we need a cutter. Come out here and get me. I have no power. I'm dead in the water. Okay, I understand you're going to be uh, unable to repair your vessel. Is that correct, sir? I have zero power. I'm dead in the water. My battery is going down again. Are you using the, uh, the pump that we dropped, sir? Sir, we got to run it, but it will not pump water. Make sure that uh, that suction hose, that white hose, is connected real snug to the front of that pump. I got on the radio and tried to walk the guy through uh, running the pump, making sure everything was correct, he was doing everything right. Scoby 2, is there somebody else that can uh, give you a tow or uh, somebody else that can come get you No, sir. Uh, the reason I'm asking is if you're in danger, think that we don't want to leave you out here alone. Uh, and we can hoist into the helicopter or, uh, or, you know, I've only got about another 40 minutes and then uh, we've got the part scene, sir. Now, well, send me a vessel to call me home. That's my livelihood. If thing goes down, I don't have no more income. You know, while we're orbiting, we're having all these conversations internally and with the master, now that he's got the handheld radio, about what to do with the vessel. Uh, and he's adamant that he's not coming off the vessel no matter what. Miami Ops, uh, he wants Coast Guard assistance, over. Meanwhile, we're also talking with District 7, our, our parent command, about different options. You know, possibly a Coast Guard cutter coming out to tow him in. 6023, this is my job. We're looking at over 24 hours. It will be a significant amount of time. And will he make his final decision to stay on the vessel or not? Got word back that it was going to be at least 24 hours before they could have a cutter on scene. So our options are starting to dwindle down. These guys aren't coming off, so we definitely want to leave better the pump. He's getting frustrated. says that pump's not working. Let's do this, Wes. We're going to put you down, get you on the boat, let you help with that one, and we're going to drop the other one, okay? Roger. Uh, I'll be off on CS changing it. Given the fact that, you know, it's going to be more than 24 hours for a tow, 
uh, we decide, hey, let's get let's get West down to the vessel, see if he can get that pump running correctly and get them dewatered, and then we'll also send him down the second pump. I just want to explain to him that he's only got about eight hours of pumping ability from these pumps, even with both of them on board. So we'll be using a bail for Tom. Yeah. Unless he can bail it fast enough with the bucket, then he's going to be uh, yeah, he's yeah. going to be swimming. Our fear was, even with the pump running, that maybe they won't keep up with the flooding and then we get a scenario where they sink and they're in the water 80 plus miles offshore. We only got about a half hour to work with on gas, just so you know. I'll make it speedy. All right, West is ready, sir. All right, begin the hoist. Roger, right, somebody's going out to cabin door. Boat check complete, somebody's going down. I knew we were running low on fuel, so I just wanted to get this done as fast as possible. And I swam over to the boat and, you know, did what I was trained to do. Two, three, rescue, right, sorry. Now on board. I'm going to explain the uh, situation. Now, I can't tell where that leaf is coming from, but there is water in the bottom of the boat. I don't know the rate at which this thing is going down. Now, I tried to get the pump running, just pump it a little bit, but can't, can't pump this water out. The boat was, in fact, taking all water. I was telling the captain, if you get stuck out here, if we leave you here and this boat goes down, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. The deckhand wants to go. The captain doesn't really want to go. OK, I understand. I hate leaving the master out here alone, though. My two cents, we got 20 minutes. It's almost time. time for one scenario. We were running low on fuel. We were constantly calculating our fuel burn at this point, and time was critical. It was either drop another pump, or we get the guys off the boat. Can you order them off, sir? I don't know if I'm ready to order these guys off. You know what I mean? He's got a life jacket. He's got an E-perb. The last thing I want to do is tell a mariner to come off their vessel. You know, it's their livelihood. It's a lot of money that they invest in this. Uh, I have a ton of respect for the fishermen that fish all around our country. You know, it's it's a difficult decision for them to leave their vessels, so uh, so it's something you don't do lightly. 6023, rescue tour. After explaining the kind of scenario, you got to get him coming off. He didn't want to be out here alone. He's about two minutes over. So uh, he's willing to get on board. Get him set up to get him in the water. We'll do two basket recoveries and a bear hook recovery for you. Roger that. He did not want to leave, but I think knowing that he'd be out there by himself, do you realize the uh, severity of the situation that could happen. And it, we've got to make it kind of quick. Got about 20 minutes to work with until we're bingo. Roger that. The whole thing about bingo fuel for us is so critical because there's nowhere to land when you're that far offshore. If you miscalculate the fuel or if you cut your bingo short, you're going in the water. All right, he's got the first survivor in the water. Swimming towards us. Bad, that's our good side. Uh, that's going down. Okay. I'd stick the captain first. He looked to be in a little bit worse condition than the, uh, the first mate. Towed him to the helicopter and put him in the basket. Survivor is clear of the water. Coming up, clear back and left. Uh, survivor is just underneath the cabin door. Distancing survivor outside the door. Got ice in the cabin. I got west of sight. Survivor in the cabin. I'm gonna get the survivor out of the basket. Once I got him into the cabin, I asked him to get in the chair. He was unresponsive at that point, so I picked him up and I put him in the chair. Once he was seated, I sent the basket out for the second guy. Survivor is just outside the door. Bring the survivor in the cabin. I'm gonna leave him in the basket. Roger. He was a lot more cooperative, had a really quick, easy pickup. I disconnected the hook from the basket, sent the hook down the door and uh, to retrieve Wes, our swimmer. Swimmer in the cabin. And hoist the police. Cabin door shut, ready for fourth line transition. Roger, on the go. Okay, guess do good. We have to make it home. We're gonna be right at our reserve. It's gonna be close. You might even see the low lights. Oh yeah. I haven't seen those in a long time. I don't like that. It was pretty straightforward getting them back. They were in good health and no injuries. Uh, he's a little distraught, I believe, but uh, it's a tough thing. It's his livelihood, he said, and uh, everything you know he has is in that boat. Yeah, I, I understand that. You know, pretty traumatic um, for them, uh, leaving their things behind. We were glad that we were able to rescue them, but we really felt for them, and, and probably a good chance the vessel's gonna go down if they don't get a salvage boat out there quick. But we feel very confident it was the right call getting them to come off the vessel. Look at 6023, runway 9 are clear to land. Ready for approach. Ready for approach. My name is Jerry Green. From Tarpon Springs, I've been fishing for 35 years. Been in the water for three and a half days before, and I ain't gonna go through that experience no more. So, called the Coast Guard to come and get us. <laughs> the Coast Guard, they're great. 
They've always been there for you. They will be there for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your hospitality and your work and your effort for what y'all do. Now this is the most interesting case I've had so far. Yeah. Good learning experience. Good All right, thank you. I'll see you in there. All right. I would definitely consider today two lives saved. I mean, there's always a great feeling when you're able to help um, the mariners that are out there. My hat's off to all the fishermen, merchant mariners, everybody else that goes out to sea. It's always an honor for me to, to be a part of that. A boat floating in the water is pretty easy to spot on a clear day like today. We didn't see anything. All right, everybody, uh, eyes outside. Roger. Two and a half, two miles out there. There's definitely something red in the water. We got six people in the water. I'm Scott Gordon, coming down here from Kodiak, Alaska, and I'm here today with my wife Erica and my daughter Allison. Over this way? Yeah. We came out to the park today to uh, check out the area, and it's really nice out, and we brought a picnic dinner so we can enjoy the, uh, the sunshine and the, uh, the warm air and getting the, getting the feel for Florida. It's nice to finally get, get here after we've been traveling forever. Such a long way away from Alaska. Our trip from Kodiak, Alaska to Clearwater, Florida was quite a long one. We were on the road for 42 days. So, babe, how's the shop? It's a busy place. It's busier like, than yeah, Kodiak? Uh, yeah, we had 19 summers in Kodiak, and there's like 24 down here. Oh, man. My wife, Erica, she's really supportive of what I do. And uh, I mean, you know, it's hard on the families to do this. Every four years or so, you have to uproot everybody, take them away from all their friends, you know moved in another location, and you know, for the families, they gotta start all over again, and uh, it had to be kind of extra special to do that. There goes the alicot right there. It's right in my eyes. Yeah. I can't see it. Look, oh, Allison. A that's Daddy's helicopter. Daddy's goes helicopter. You used to get really excited about Daddy's helicopter. Now, not so much, huh? Had a really good time tonight. It was nice to be able to come out here and just, you know, kind of relax a little bit. The sunset was beautiful. Yeah, it was. Air Station Clearwater Operations, Lieutenant Miller. I'm uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Patrick Miller. I'm uh, stationed at Air Station Clearwater. Today I'm the Operations Duty Officer. It's about quarter six in the morning. Uh, we just got a call from uh, Sector Mobile that uh, they received a mayday call from a vessel taken on water. Uh, vessel's location is about 30 miles south of uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Right now we're launching a MH60 to fly a search pattern and uh, look for the best with that uh, transmitted the Mayday call. How are we doing to the back, man? Uh, everything's looking good, back here. Flight check complete, Charlie. All right, roger, set doors. Starting engine doors, lock. Pilot. Pilot. Echo pilot, engine issue. All right, we're taking off, because the crew pretty take off. There we go. Got a tailwind pushing us, giving us about 60, 20 knots, so that's pushing us up to 150 knots of ground speed. So we're now 30 minutes out from the uh, search area. AST-1, Scott Gordon, here at Air Station Clearwater, Florida. It was 5.45 in the morning, and we rolled out of here before the sun got up, and uh, not knowing much what we were going to do, but we, you know, always prepared for anything. They say this is more of a sailboat or a fishing boat? They said a 45-foot sport fishing vessel. Okay, I got an idea what it is. As we got closer, we were able to get some additional information that it was a 45-foot um, pleasure craft with six persons on board. In addition to that, they were able to give us a GPS position where they believe the vessel could possibly be located. And we're over the uh, last position they gave us. All right, everybody, uh, eyes outside. Roger. A boat floating in the water is, you know, pretty easy to spot on a clear day like today. We didn't see anything. Okay, I've got a uh, possible position at 
one o'clock. I've got something in sight there. We'll go see what it is. When we initially got to that GPS coordinate, um, we didn't see anything, so we reported that to Sector, and they had a search plan for us to do about 10 miles away. Okay, now we just flew over the position. We're going to the search they gave us. Our right, position is one mile out of the 12 o'clock, so everybody scanning outside as we fly through. About a half, two miles out there. What do you think you see? It yeah, looks maybe like a bow. There's but definitely something red in the water. I've got a raft. Hi, my name is Matt Tichetto. I'm an AMT3 flight mechanic here at Air Station uh, Clearwater. Weather on scene, it's uh, pretty bad out there. Patches of rain here and there. The waves were, I'd say, five feet. They were getting beat up a little bit there in the water. We could tell when we flew by. It looks like they're floating on maybe a cooler or something. I don't see a raft, but I think they have flotation. They have some kind of flotation. It looks like some, uh, some, some red, some pipe rings. Yeah. As we're headed towards them, I saw um, what appeared to be um, six persons in a raft, um, but really it was the six individuals wearing their flotation in a circle around their cooler. We're going to pick up these six. Oh, I need to uh, dump pump. There's definitely something red in the water. We got six people in the water. We got a call for a vessel taken on water. We did receive a report that it was a 45-foot pleasure craft a motor vessel with six persons on board. So that's what we were looking for and expecting when we got on scene. We're going to pick up these six. Oh, I need to uh, dump pump. OK, we'll plan on that. When we initially took off out of here, we had a call for a boat taken on water, and we didn't know much about it. We didn't know the size or anything, so we went ahead and elected to take a second pump along with us. As we got closer and started to realize that the boat sunk, we realized that we didn't have a whole lot of room inside the helicopter, especially for six people, so um, we went ahead and uh, dropped the pumps for the ocean. Uh, are you good with the getting rid of both the pumps? Yeah, I'm good with that. A pump being dropped off in the middle of the ocean is a, you know, a whole lot better option than you know leaving people behind and not being able to pick somebody up, so uh, you know, human life is worth a lot more than just a pump. Okay, you are uh, there to jettison whatever you need to. Pumps away. Then the other pump away. So we sent those overboard and wanted to get our swimmer in the water to assess their medical condition. So we uh, sent him down on a harness deployment so that way he can quickly get into the water in a good, safe position, swim over to their location, and we prepare them for the deployment. Swimmer's ready. We get the one. Under. Swimmer's outside cabin door. Boat check complete. So we're going down. Swimmer's going down. Swimmer's going in the water. Swimmer's in the water. Swimmer's away. Swimmer's OK. Clear to move back and left. Swimmer's coming out of your three flex position. When I first came up on him, there was one individual that wasn't looking too good. He was pretty seasick and dehydrated. And as soon as I got there, the, you know, the other guys were pointing him and said, hey, take him first. As soon as the first person is cleared out of the water in the basket and I see him heading up and he's good to go, I swim right back to the group. Back going down. Back in the water. Just approach the basket. Back clear water, clear to move back and left. Go back left, stay back. Hey, survivors inside cabin. I'd pick one survivor up, get them secured and safe in the cabin, and send down the basket again. At that time, Scott's swimming back to the group, picking another person out so we can keep continuing on. Worked out really well. I mean, by the time I went back to the group and got somebody and grabbed him and sort of swim him back over, by that time the helicopter was uh, already heading back towards me. It went like clockwork. I was uh, grateful we got everyone up into the cabin. All I had left to do was pick up my swimmer, Scott, and uh, we could be on our way. Roger. Roger. Coming up to the cabin door. So we're looking at nine to the back, crunch the numbers real quick. Let's say we're adding 1,200 pounds. See how much fuel we got on here. That puts about 19.5. I know we were a little low on fuel, 
So we uh, proceeded to the nearest airport that has fuel. Uh, we took them to Apalachicola. Well, it was my boat, and about 4 o'clock, Todd brought it to my attention that we had water on the cockpit. I'm sitting, what are you talking about? I thought he was joking. Walked out to the cockpit. There was about probably eight inches of water on the cockpit. I said, I'll go up to the fly bridge. I'll crank the engines up. Cranked one of the engines up and said, oh, my baby did not let me down. Second engine did not crank. First engine cut off. At that time, I said, this boat is going down. You don't really realize what's happening until you actually step off the back of the boat. It's like a dream, you know, everything, you know, you always think there's, everything's gonna be okay. You know, of course, at this point it wasn't. Is everyone's first time on a helicopter? Yes. Have a great time. You never know what's gonna happen. That boat in a million years would have never thought it went down. The boat was that new, that nice. We don't know what happened. Whatever happened was something that was terrible and it happened quick and I wish it would have never happened. Glad you're doing all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, hey, right guys. I certainly appreciate it. Coast Guard, Air Station, Clearwater, y'all rock. Just wanted to take a chance to say, uh, great job. I mean, did awesome work out there, made it happen. Uh, found those guys and uh, got them to safety, so I'm really happy with the outcome of how it went tonight. Yeah, I think the hoist and everything went good. Um, went quick. About the time I got the, you know, person in the basket going over to get the next one, basket was right back down there, so it went. You know, it's a good feeling when you go out and uh, you make a difference like that. Well, great job, guys. Thanks, Yeah, Thanks, sir. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, when you get to actually pull somebody out of the water, it's, it makes you, you know, fall in love your job all over again.